Thank you, Pastor Pavel, um, for that really beautiful introduction and also just for um, your friendship and for your confidence in asking me to share this morning um, on a Sunday. I'm very, very honored um, that you would do that. And so I wanted to say also thank you to this wonderful church family um, for having me here with you this morning. You have always been so welcoming to me and to my family. And also Mark, right? That's <laughs> Welcome to Mark is here. Uh, Mark and I, uh, it's his first time here. Say hello. Um, Mark and I uh, met at the checkout at Staples last week, um, and we, through one way or another, got into a conversation about the Lord, and um, I told him about TSC Summit Campus and invited him to come to church here, and um, he asked me who the preacher was, and I had to stop for a second, because for the first time in my entire life, I said, well, it's me on Sunday. <laughs> Um, which <laughs> it has never been before, but today is the first day. Um, so uh, thank you for coming and for being here and for, for bearing with me. Um, let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Lord Jesus, to share about who you are, God, to speak your name, God. God, you say that your word never returns void, God. So I stand here on that promise, God, that as we open scripture and we talk about you and who you are, God, God, that it will not return void, Lord. God, I pray that you speak to every heart here, God. I pray that whoever it is that needs to hear this message from you today, God, that you would bring down every barrier, God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord God, would fill me, God, that you would take my nerves, God, and you would let me just share what you've put into my heart to share today, God. God, I pray that I would disappear and you would appear, my God. I pray that you would minister, Lord, to every person and every life that's here, God. I thank you that you're in this place, my God. I thank you that your presence is already here and that you want to do something amazing in the hearts of, the, of those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So while I was praying through what to share with you today, um, it struck me the importance of gathering together as believers and to encourage each other in the faith and to share our stories with each other and to share the stories of what God has done and what he's done in our lives. And the purpose is that we can inspire each other and we can also draw closer together, um, closer to Jesus. And today I want to talk a little bit about the importance of sharing your story and of sharing stories of what God has done in your life. Um, I've always imagined, I'm a very visual person, so I've always imagined that when we get to heaven, we're each going to have this novel that's written about our lives, about this thick, and we'll walk around kind of with it under our arms, and it's going to be Kate's story or Mark's story or Ben's story, and, and each one of us will have a unique title and, and a unique story. But I just imagine that we walk around saying like, oh my goodness, have you read Pavel's story or Haley's, or can I trade you your book for mine? And... Um, and we'll be able to read through all of each other's stories and our own stories over and over and recount the things that God walked us through in our lives and the mountaintops and the valleys and the difficult things and the miraculous things. And each one of us, each one of those stories will be a miracle. Each one will be amazing from cover to cover about what God did in our lives. And not only will we have our own books but we'll have people who come up to us and say, do you know that you're in my chapter 12? We become minor characters in other people's novels. And some people's were, were one of the main characters. That's with the, I am a very bossy character in Ben's book right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we're, we are main characters in some of our friends' stories. And some of them were just there for a moment or just there for a chapter. 
But the amazing thing will be the lines of people who say, do you know that you made it into my story, that you were here, that you were in this moment, that you shared this thing with me? Um, and I think we'll be truly amazed about how God used our lives when we're not afraid to step out and start sharing our stories. There is a book written by a man named John Bunyan. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. And it is a thick book, <laughs> about that big. And it's the book that always comes to my mind when I think of this. And I spent the last two years reading it in fits and starts. I have two kids, so the ability to sit down and read for long chunks is limited. But um, a couple of years ago, those of us who work at the Bible school here, Summit, we were encouraged to read through that book. And I did. And there were portions of that book that blew me away. It was written in 1678, and it is regarded as one of the most significant works of theological fiction ever written. It's it's inspired authors who've come after that, famous ones like Tolstein and C.S. Lewis. They were all uh, inspired by this book. John Bunyan began working on the book when he was imprisoned for preaching the gospel in the mid-1600s, on and off for over 10 years. And Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory which tells the story of Christian, who's an everyman character who journeys from his hometown called the City of Destruction to a new place called the Celestial City and which represents heaven and the whole book is his journey from the city of destruction to celestial city and throughout the book he has many times where he has victories he has pitfalls he has times where he gets knocked completely off course and where god brings him back and through his journey there are other characters who are introduced along the way some of them are helpful Some of them spur him on in their journey. Some of them are deceitful. Some of them knock him into difficult places. And the part that really stood out to me was this one portion of the book that I read at least two or three times. And it was while Christian has just come through the hill of difficulty. And there's a lot of chapters about the Hill of Difficulty, but we're all already hundreds of pages in before we get here. So his journey from City of Destruction to Celestial City, he's been, it's already been years, and he's come through this moment of Hill of Difficulty, and he finally gets over that hill. And along the way, he meets two characters named Mistrust and Timorous, And mistrust and timorous come running up to meet him as he's coming down the hill of difficulty. And they tell him, you've got to turn back. And he can't believe it. And they say, you have to turn back. We've just come through this narrow pathway that gets to the resting place where travelers can rest on their journey. But you have to go through a narrow path and there are lions there. And we've heard them and we've seen them. And they are destroying people who walk through there, and it's impossible. And Christian, in his journey, cannot believe this. He's come so far. He's gone through so many things, and he gets to this place where he hears them, and he's debating if he's going to turn back. And he goes and he looks down the long, narrow valley path that gets to that place of rest, and he sees the lions, and he hears them, and he thinks this is true. Oh, no, it's true. And he's about to turn back when all of a sudden he hears a voice far in the distance, and he can't see who it is, but he hears this voice, and he strains to listen and strains to listen to what the voice is saying. And finally he hears in the distance as he quiets himself and he listens to the voice, he hears that the voice is yelling, the lions are chained. They're chained. And he starts to walk. And he knows that he has to believe this voice. And if you've never read the book, go and read this part because it talks about how he shakes. 
And he starts to walk through. And the voice says, do not move to the left or to the right. Keep walking forward. They will not harm you. They are chained. And as he walks through and he feels them lunging and he hears them roaring, they do not touch a hair on his head. And he makes it through to the other side. When you share your story and you tell others of what God's have done in your life, you become like this porter. He gets to the other side and realizes who it is. He meets him. And it's a porter who stands at the other end and who's traveled through. And he says that God has told him to stand there and shout back through that the lions are chained. And he doesn't know who's standing there or who's hearing him, but he keeps on shouting it. And he keeps on telling them. And I don't know about you, but I really think that we could use some porters today in this generation. Would you agree with me? We are living in a volatile time in history. The headlines are scary. Every other day it's something where you start to get to the point where you just don't want to read it anymore. Um, yesterday I was at the grocery store going through the aisles trying to figure out with the inflating prices how we can cut down on groceries, how we can just buy the essentials, what we're going to do if gas prices keep going up, how we're going to provide for our kids and our family through this. I know that I'm not alone here. That You guys have felt this as well. I went home and I needed to order a new backpack for my son who's starting school and I found myself online debating whether or not I should get the backpack with the extra room for his basketball shoes or the backpack that's bulletproof. And suddenly I had to stop and I say, God, how do I do this? How do I raise my kids without fear and instill hope for the future in a world like this? How do we do this? And it hit me the importance of raising them around stories of God's faithfulness. Because difficult days will come for this generation. You can be sure of it. But they will remember the promises of God And as they begin to build their own stories, they'll gain footing in ours. The stories of men and women in the Bible who endured difficult days and came through the other side, they need porters. I know many of you know the story of David and Goliath. If we can turn there in our Bibles, it's 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I know that it's a story that you're very familiar with that many of us have heard over and over again. And I want to start at verse 4. It says, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then he will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. I want to pause there for a moment. Because in the midst of this, in the midst of all the taunting and the fear that was going on in that place, David shows up and he's a kid. And essentially, he's there to bring snacks for the army. And he hears the taunts of Goliath. And before I get to what his response is, I want to just pause here for a moment and think about where David was during this scene and during this moment in his life. 
David was a shepherd who had been dutifully watching the sheep in the fields. And during this time, he had been writing psalms and songs to the Lord. And I can just imagine him as a young man saying, God, I want my life to count. I'm all in. I want to sing. I want to worship you. I just, I want to be used. I want to be in your presence. Here I am as a shepherd guarding your sheep. What is it that you want me to do? And you know what happens? A lion shows up and attacks him and attacks his sheep. And I can imagine the first time that ever happened to him, he must have been terrified. He must have been calling out to the Lord to save him. But you know what? God delivered him and he slayed that lion. And I bet you after that happened, he was praying and thanking God for the protection. And I don't know why that happened, God, but okay, like that's going to be a great testimony of your faithfulness and how you, you brought me through. And uh, I'm going to start maybe practicing with a slingshot a little bit because um, I'm all in, God. I don't know why that happened to me, but I'm, I'm here and I'm with you and I'm writing these psalms and that are going to minister to people. And then a bear shows up and attacks him and attacks his sheep. And I can imagine as he's going through this for the second time, again, you start to wonder, why is this happening to me? What is the purpose of this battle? Why is this going on again? You know, and maybe this time, but he remembers how God delivered him the first time. And he hangs on to that confidence that God will see him through again. But maybe it's difficult and he's left questioning all the trials that what is going on, God, I just want to serve you. I just want to, I just want to have my life count. And all that's happening is I'm getting attacked and things are happening to me. And I just wonder when he shows up at the army, to deliver their snacks. And he's just the kid that's there and he hears Goliath taunting and he hears what's going on. I just wonder if all of a sudden, all of the things that he had been through and all of the battles that God had placed before him started to make sense because his confidence was that he had already been through these battles and he had learned to trust God. And he was confident in his God, not in himself, but in his God. I just want to read, starting at verse 32. I'm reading the New Living Translation. David says, don't worry about this Philistine, he said to Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replies. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted, and here's where he tells his story. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Hallelujah. And I'm skipping down to verse 41, where Goliath walks out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David, that you come at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his God. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. But David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord has rescued his people, not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. And as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead, And the stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. 
So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Where did he get that kind of confidence to fight Goliath? By the time he made it to the battlefield that day, he was ready. He was armed with the stories of the faithfulness of God and how he had been with him through trial after trial. Now, doesn't that put every lion and bear story that you have into perspective? I don't know why difficult things happen in our lives, but I do know that God wastes nothing. He uses these stories to strengthen our lives and to strengthen us and give us a testimony of his glory. I want to be like David. When the giants come, I want to remember how he has carried me through, and I want to refuse to back down. Because I think that you and I know that there are some giants in the valley right now. When our society tries to tell us that God should be put away, that our nation will be better off as a post-Christian society, God, give us the strength to stand up and say, who is this Philistine allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Our fight... It's not an ideological one. It's not a political one. Pastor Tim said last Sunday, heaven help us if we try to fit God into our ideological agendas. He's so much bigger than that. But our fight is because we have experienced and we know the matchless love of a God who would send his own son down to die for us. We have known deliverance from fear the love of a father that reaches down when we are at our lowest point and picks us back up. So when the world today is yelling, get rid of him, the modern day vision version of crucify him, we stand at the other end of that narrow path and we say, wait a minute, I need to tell you a story. This is the most important story that you will ever hear. And it starts in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He came and he died for you and he loves you. He is for you. He is going to give you a life abundantly beyond all that you can imagine. He has a story for that novel beyond anything that you could ever think. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you've never experienced what it's like to walk through life with him, the most important story you could ever hear today is the one where he came and died for you and he wants that personal relationship with you. It says about his death in Matthew 27, and when Jesus had cried out again, he, he, in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rock split and tombs literally broke open. In that moment, Christ broke the power of death, the power of sin, the power of hell, the power of addiction, the power of anything that holds claim over your life. You don't have to listen to the lies anymore. The lions are chained. When he went to the cross and he died for you, he took it all with him. All the power of sin and death, he took everything with him. And he took it to the grave. And on the third day, Matthew 28 says, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Going to the tomb, he rolled back the the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, 
For I know that you look for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. When the disciples went to Galilee and the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, they saw him and they worshiped him. And do you know what one of the last things he said to them was? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. It doesn't matter if you're on a mountaintop or a valley or what you've done. He is with you to the very end of the age. I want to read one more scripture. It's Psalm 23. It's one of the most famous songs and poems ever written out of the most famous book ever written in history. It's written by David when he was king. He was not a young man anymore. And he had been through a lot. This was many years after the lions, after the bears, after the giant fights, the battles, the betrayals, his own sins, his own victories, his own defeats. And it was his porter moment where he was standing on the other side of that long valley with the lions and he was turning back to talk to the generations coming after him. And yet, it was not his own story he mentions. Instead, he illuminates the astonishing goodness of God, understanding that it was Christ's story all along that was within him. Jesus. And he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jesus. His story was not about how he killed giants, how he defeated how he became king. His story was about the Lord being his shepherd and everything being about him. If God has kept you from lions, if God has defeated giants in your life, tell your story. You don't have to be a preacher. However God gives it to you and whoever you interact with, tell your story. Because the world needs you as a porter. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, today can be the very first day of that story with him. You will never regret handing your book over to Jesus and letting him pen the remainder of your pages. You will never, not for one day, regret that decision. I'm going to let Pastor Carter come and just close out the service in a moment. But I just wanted to close by saying that recently my husband and I started a connect group. And we've been reading portions of uh, Pastor Tim Delina's 260 journey with other families that have kids. And last week, as uh, we were singing in worship, when we were done, I opened my eyes and I saw my two sons singing and worshiping the Lord in our living room, which is not a common occurrence in our house. <laughs> but I want to tell you that in that moment, all of the anxious thoughts disappeared from my heart 
And I thought, this is how, this is how I'm going to raise them in a world like today. I am going to keep telling them Christ's story within me. I am going to keep reminding them that the lions are chained. And I felt like I heard the Lord whisper that to my heart. He said, do not be afraid, for I am with you to the very end of the age. I felt him whisper to my heart, keep moving forward. Don't look to the left or to the right. Keep walking forward. The lions are chained. <laughs>